All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Meet the Professors event. My name is Curtis Isozaki, Assistant Director of the Honors College at Aziza Pacific University. And it is such a pleasure to be able to be a part of this Meet the Professors event. It's been a joy to be a part of the overall college admissions journey with each and every one of you and looking forward to hopefully seeing you here on campus. Um, We'd love to just um, provide a little introduction to Aziza Pacific University and the Honors College before we dive into our panel event. We have such great guests joining us and you'll actually have the opportunity to ask some questions. As many of you know, Aziza Pacific University was founded in 1899 as a God-first university, as a training school for Christian workers. And over the years, our commitment to that mission of equipping and training difference makers has never been more true. I always tell people throughout the overall college admissions process that really, you know, your four years in college will be some of the most foundational years of your life. You know, so So many students and young professionals and uh, people just like yourself have great ambition. And amidst all that ambition and enthusiasm and passion, it really is your foundation. Your foundation will be solidified by our four cornerstones, Christ, scholarship, community, and service. And it'll become the launching pad to something bigger and better for the rest of your life. And those four years are catalytic to your overall formation. And you'll learn about the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences today. You'll learn about the Honors College. You'll learn about the day in the life of a faculty member, their expertise, and and really that cornerstone scholarship. You're not just going to a big Christian camp in Christian higher education, but you're coming for the spiritual formation, the missional service, the intercultural interactions on this campus and outside of this campus to study away experiences, but in the very social fabric of the living learning community that is at APU. And for yourself and many of you, potentially the Honors College is going to be the scholarship, your study, your academic discipline, um, your overall vocation and career aspirations. You have the opportunity today to learn from your faculty members about the ways that we educate difference makers in truth and light. And so in the Honors College, it's just going to be one part of your overall college uh, journey and really our mission to educate the next generation of intellectually gifted Christian leaders. And so the way that we do that is through a student-centered approach to your education that consists of rigorous curriculum, relevant academia, in relation to pedagogy. You're going to be challenged in the things that you're learning. You're going to be able to relate what you're studying to things that you've learned in the past, also the ways in which you're going to apply that for your career. And you're going to do that in the context of the living learning community. And a part of that is your faculty members. For me, as a double alumni, it is the relationship, the discipleship, and the mentorship of faculty members that made an impact in my life that has made me who I am today. It has led to job opportunities has led to, um, in my pursuit of wanting to be an educator, it's led to opportunities for student teaching and now even as a faculty member here at APU as well. Looking forward for the opportunity for you to get to know these faculty members today, but something I want you to remind all of you, as many of you are in the process of deciding where you're going to go, you know, after the next few weeks of discernment or even the last few months of figuring out where you're going to go to college, um, just imagine just a few months from now, you may end up at Azusa Pacific University as a part of this candela ceremony. And we, we light these candles as a reminder that we're all called to be salt and light. You know, salt adds, adds flavor uh, to the meals that you have. Um, light changes atmospheres. Right. In the same way, we hope that students that graduate from Azusa Pacific University don't just go here, uh, but go from here as salt and light. People add flavor to conversations and illuminate atmospheres. I'm looking forward to the opportunity that you have to get to know our faculty today. And so I would absolutely love to just start off by introducing them to you. I would love for our faculty members who are here today to be able to introduce yourselves, your name, your department, your title, and the degrees that you hold here at Aziza Pacific University. Good evening, everyone. My name is Louise Huang, and I am um, currently serving as Assistant Dean in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I teach an introductory chemistry course in Honors College and also an environmental studies minor program. I got my bachelor's degree from Cornell University and then my master's and my PhD from University of California, Davis. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Ethan Shrum. I'm Associate Professor of History at Aziza Pacific, and I'm also 
director of the humanities program. Uh, and my background is rather interesting, unusual, some might say, in that my earlier degrees were in chemistry and chemical engineering from Illinois Wesleyan at the bachelor's level and Northwestern University at the graduate level. And I then switched and went into the humanities. I did a master's in religion and American life at Wheaton College, and then a PhD in history at the University of Pennsylvania. I teach many U.S. history courses at APU, as well as a few different courses in the Honors College and in the humanities program. Good evening. I'm Dr. Petrie. I'm the Chair of English and Modern Languages, as well as a professor and an Honors College faculty fellow. I went straight through from bachelor's to master's to PhD, all in one um, blur. But that's how much I love literature, which all of my degrees are in. So a BA from Pepperdine, an MA and a PhD from the University of Delaware. And um, I recently released a book on one of my favorite areas of research. It's called Templates for Authorship, and it's about the different pathways that American women writers have taken to building a career uh, in publication. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Peanut McCoy. I am the chair of the Department of Math, Physics, and Statistics. I'm on the physics side, which is the most fun side because we get to have all the toys in our stock room, but it's really the toy box. <laughs> so I got my bachelor's from Caltech and my uh, PhD from University of Minnesota. And I've been now here at APU for 15 years. Some of you have already shared a little bit about where you, your scholarship is from, where you got your different degrees. Would you be able to share a little bit about why and how you ended up becoming a professor at Azusa Pacific University? So I am very blessed that my calling and opportunity kind of intersected right when the Sagerstrom Science Center was being built. There was an opportunity um, for new faculty to join, and um, there was an opportunity and an opening to teach nursing chemistry. So I um, was very blessed to, to be able to do that. Um, that's how I started my time here in Azusa Pacific. I've been at APU since 2014, and I was previously a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Virginia. And uh, I had met my wife there. We got married in Virginia, uh, had a, our first child. And when he was three weeks old, we set off for California, which is rather interesting timing. But it was good timing that the APU opportunity came open uh, at that time as uh, my uh, stint at the University of Virginia was winding down and APU was looking for somebody uh, who specialized in 20th century U.S. history and could teach uh, history of American foreign relations. Well, I've been at APU for six years and I taught at a couple other of the CCCU schools, the Council on Christian Colleges and Universities, for about 15 years since I finished my doctorate. The truth is I'm a Californian and I wanted to be back in California, but also when I saw the need that the English department had to bring in a new chair for the department, I looked at the people and I looked at the program and I realized that I could come here and not sacrifice any of my love of teaching and love of mentoring students. Those are my, my favorite things uh, in the world to do, but I knew I could still do that at the same level and also really grow and expand into a culture of writing and research and publication. APU is a uh, a Carnegie R2 university, and there aren't other Christian colleges that are like that. So it allowed me to build one more thing that I feel called to do and not give up the other things that I love and feel called to do. So that's why I'm here. So I get to share a bit of a, a God moment in answering this question. So I came straight out of grad school uh, and I, I was on the fence whether I would, wanted to go to a Christian college or a, or a secular college. I, I was just open to whatever came my way. And so the, the way that I was going about my job search, I know I wanted to be primarily teaching because uh, that's where my passion is with, with really helping students learn. And I, I'm a physicist, so I went to the American Physical Society uh, classifieds and started just searching. And the very first day that I started searching the classifieds, it's alphabetical. The first listing that came up was APU. So I go to the website and look at the mission statement. And 
hey, the, those four cornerstones, Christ, come on, community scholarship and service, and the mission statement. This, this is my personal mission statement. <laughs> so APU was number one on my list from day one of my job search. And that is an amazing God moment. All of you are absolutely brilliant and could truly teach anywhere, study anywhere else, conduct research anywhere else, but y'all choosing to be at Aziza Pacific for that end and that mission, and that Carnegie Hall designation is significant to our institution. As you reflect on your time here at Aziza Pacific University and the reality that so many of the students in this call and many who will be tuning in later, there's so many different options of where, where students can go to for school. Um, and what would you say, each of you say, differentiates Azusa Pacific University academically from other universities? And how would you describe your classroom experiences in the day-to-day -day of the work that you do? I would say is the holistic education that really um, makes us distinct. I was fortunate enough to learn chemistry from a Nobel laureate, and he was great in explaining um, the how, but there was no explanation of the why which definitely embedded in um, some of the, the quests and the, and the exploration of different subjects and, and um, topics that we, we learn in science. And in our classroom, um, we don't get to just transfer information and explain the how, but we take a moment to pause and ask those hard questions. Why is it happening? Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. And those are really rich moments in which we all pause and think and maybe share and challenge each other with different perspectives. And I think we walk away really being enriched. I would say that people at uh, Azusa Pacific are really genuinely caring. I think there's a level of care that is notable uh, in comparison to other places. And that's something that touches the student experience. I just had a student remarking on that to me the other day. I think uh, we give a lot of personal attention to students as faculty members uh, in advising and mentoring. Uh, I know I've had the opportunity to work with several students in research in different capacities. We have the uh, SURE program, which is an annual uh, competition for an undergraduate student to pair with a faculty mentor and to receive some funding to do a research project. And I've had the uh, blessing of being a SURE mentor twice. And one of those students ended up getting his article published in the National Undergraduate History Journal, which is extremely rare. And so this is one of those things that goes along with this uh, Carnegie classification of R2 uh, high research activity that we were talking about earlier. This is a distinctive that APU has, as Dr. Petrie was saying, there is a, a culture of research here that doesn't uh, exist so much in a lot of other Christian colleges. We see that in the Honors College and the Senior Oxbridge opportunity that all of the Honors Humanities majors do, uh, as well as in the disciplines, whether you're you know, working with an individual professor in history or English and physics, all these departments have really good opportunities for research. And so that opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with a professor is something that I think is distinctive about EP. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely true. What both of you were just saying, um, it, it really is a question of what is added at APU. Because you can you can find the opportunities, you can work with experts, you can publish your work uh, even as an undergraduate, your scholarly work or um, in our department, students tend to publish creative work uh, as well, not just in our in-house literary magazine, but also externally as well. Um, and so it's it's it's. The opportunities and the expertise plus that mentorship. We're here to challenge you intellectually and encourage you spiritually at the same time. And I would say that that's really the essence of what is distinct. All right. The other three panelists already took the, the big, really great answers. So I would go into the detail answers. So I'm going to go for experience in, in my department of mathematics and statistics that and give an example of something I think is likely also true in most of the other departments at campus. We take teaching and teaching well really, really seriously in our department. And, and that is not always normal. Uh, you probably all have had some pretty terrible math teachers in your time. I hope not, but it's quite likely. Science as well. Uh, lots of scientists tend to not really 
treat their teaching in a scientific way. But over the last 20 years or so, there's been a large amount of research into how to teach well. And many of the faculty in our department are are constantly reading that literature and trying things out in class and seeing what works and what doesn't and getting really good experience as well as good data that, to really back up the, the why of that experience. Uh, so we're constantly training ideas. We're, we're becoming better teachers all the time. We get to be continual learners just like you all do. And just kind of cap off that point, you all have been living in the pandemic just like the rest of us for the last two years. Teaching has been really hard and learning over the last couple of years. So the way that my department responded to that when we were forced to go into emergency remote teaching is we all came together as a team and tried to brainstorm what what do we really want to do in our teaching and how can we do that with now the restrictions of the technology we've got. We spent several hours workshopping and trying things out on each other, kind of role-playing how we as as though we were the students while people were trying things out and it worked our student evaluations went up substantially last year during the middle of the pandemic and almost all of the faculty in my department have come away from that experience with ways to teach better now that we're back in person even that we're we're keeping from the pandemic because we've learned so well that's one part of my detail answer another part i'll give is i like the APU has the opportunity for lots of connections between your learning, taking the approach of all truth is God's truth. So yeah, I'm a scientist and it, science helps reveal God's character through the way that he created. But I really like the humanities as well. So I'm, I'm a playwright and this is why I got recruited to work in the Honors College. And that allows me to do a lot of, of scholarship as well in interdisciplinary ways that may not be available at maybe larger schools that, that are more segmented in the way that they approach their truth seeking. So for example, uh, some of my, my research is, is on physics education. The most recent publication that I have was about how the ways that we talk about faith in my physics classroom actually affects students in a positive way in the way that they understand what science is. Now, somebody at a secular university would not even think to ask that question. We have that opportunity here. I also have interdisciplinary research going on, working with a couple of chemists and biologists on what sorts of experiences uh, lead people to uh, adopt an identity as a scientist. And I'm working with a faculty in the English department uh, on a similar project. Uh, what sorts of things lead people to identify themselves as a writer? So these, these sorts of connections around campus because... All truth is God's truth, I think, are a really great opportunity. And, and the Honors College is a great place to help build those connections for yourselves as you are budding into scholars. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for thanks for sharing, everyone. I love that word interdisciplinary because it's a true representation of of oh, the classmates in the classroom environment. That is your colloquies. It is truly interdisciplinary. We often say in the honors college that the texts that you read don't just speak speak for the honors college, but really it speaks to the honors college. Um, as you're reading these various texts together, um, you're going to be in the classroom with business students, science students, allied health students, engineering students, political local science students, English students, journalism students, you name it. And gathering together, having a conversation on natural selection. How many of you know about natural selection and Darwin's work on that, right? We had an English student who, who was studying that topic in her nature course, uh, her junior year, and wrote a exegetical commentary of the role that natural selection plays in the publishing industry. I mean, just such a fascinating interdisciplinary conversation and dialogue that takes place. Um, you'll learn from different subject uh, matter experts in your honors college discussion classes. But if you're a business major here or a nursing student here, there are distinct aspects of your program that you'll be able to learn specifically about from a faculty member. In this room, we have different subject matter experts here. And so would each of you be able to share a distinct aspect of the program that you represent at Azusa Pacific University? So I'll speak on behalf of biology and chemistry. Um, many of you already heard that we are our two designated institution, which means that we are very serious about our research. Many of our science students do research in the summer and throughout the academic year. And that doesn't just mean that they are going to be in the lab, but they will be mentored by faculty and also have opportunities to present. And you already heard some publish, some even publish as first author, um, which is pretty neat as an undergraduate. 
um, it is a very um, special and, and privileged opportunity. Um, there are equipments in our Sigurdsson Science Building in which there are hundreds of thousands of dollars. But undergraduates get to have hands-on um, experience on these equipment. And as a result, once they graduate here, whether they're going to the industry or continuing with graduate school, it will really put them ahead of others. So I would say research is really uh, one area that we do well, especially undergraduate research. I'm going to echo that for my department, which is the Department of History and Political Science. I already talked a little bit about my own experience with mentoring students in research earlier, but I'll say that that cuts across uh, really much of our department. So recently at the National Conference on Faith and History, which was held at Baylor University, we had two of our history students present at that conference. Uh, also on the political science side of our department, we've had a lot of uh, research success. Dr. Palm, our department chair this past year, mentored a student research sure project on missile defense systems. And uh, Dr. Sellers has mentored a number of student research projects in the past, uh, public policy, welfare policy, and other similar topics. So really across history and political science, we have quite a strong record of mentoring student research. Yes, I know that's something that I think all of us here, and I would venture to say all of the disciplines who aren't here on uh, this call would also be able to say is that mentoring students to present and publish their work, even as undergraduate. We um, had one of our undergraduate students present at the annual International Sigma Tau Delta Conference. It's an international English honor society. She presented her work two weeks ago. She had presented something she had written for for one of our undergraduate courses that she was able to uh, edit and workshop and with faculty mentoring, get that accepted to present at the conference. And then we also um, provide funding through some of the means that Dr. Shrum already uh, noted and through other um, endowed funds for our honor society, we can sponsor students to travel to those conferences so it doesn't cost them anything. But I would say another distinctive of our department, and I hope you don't mind, Curtis, if I mentioned too, the Honors College is very much based on the cohort model where you have the curriculum is very clear and set and you're in your cohort, which is really wonderful. One of the best ways that it pairs in our department for the English major is that that is intentionally designed with a lot of flexibility. And so you have on the one side, if you were, say, an honors English um, student, you have this very structured cohort on the one side of your education and this flexibility to sort of create your own path through the major on the other side. So we have five free electives in the English program. Students can take all of them in creative writing. They could take all of them in global, ethnic, uh, or identity literatures. They could focus those electives on literature and the sacred, literature and religious experience. They could become... Uh, what we call in the field an Americanist and just take all of their electives in different types of American literature. So there's a lot of flexibility. I would say that's one of the distinctives of the way we've built our major. Every core requirement, you have at least three options to choose from to meet that requirement. And then that plus five courses of just free elective choice. The second distinctive I should mention as well um, is often very helpful to uh, honors uh, college students and to be ambitious students, hungry to learn, to have more challenge. So in our program, we also have a four plus one bachelor's to master's program. And so um, we allow students who are upper level students to take graduate courses in their senior year to count for undergraduate course credit, which basically means your undergraduate tuition ends up paying for three of the 10 required courses to end up with a master's degree. So it's an accelerated program where then after graduation, a what would have been a two-year master's becomes a one-year and is essentially um, on sale, I guess you could say, but not really a temporary sale. It's 33% off, really. So that's another distinctive that, that we have. We really want students to be able to to chart their own course through all of the diverse types of opportunities in our discipline. So I will also share two distinctives. 
because I'm sure we all have many great things that we can share. Just following up on the four plus one, we also have a four plus one in math, physics, and statistics. The plus one would be a master's in applied statistics and analytics. Okay, so that's, that's the short one. Um, my big answer to this question is collaboration is, is a distinctive of our department. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to one of our math majors who has a sister who is a math major at a, at a UC. Uh, and she said her, her sister was just kind of shocked when she described how her classes go because at the UC where she's attending, she, she said, oh, no, nobody cares about me. And in my classes, I feel like I'm competing with them. And that is just not how we do things in this department at all. This is a collaborative effort. We're all here to help each other learn and not to compete with each other. You could maybe think of it as we're like competing against the math that we want to learn, but we're doing it together as a, as a team. And that includes the faculty, that includes the students. Uh, and we have one other unique feature in there, uh, learning assistants who are undergraduate students that have taken a class before and they go back to the class and receive pay to help the students learn. And they facilitate lots of interactive uh, teaching activities. Uh, that's a collaborative program between Department of Math, Physics and Statistics and Department of Biology and Chemistry. Uh, so that's a great place to really make a difference as an upperclassman student, helping out the younger students, as well as to shore up your own uh, understanding of the material and get some pay and and some good resume items as well and leadership experience. Uh, so I think that's a nice distinctive. Fantastic. So some of you are teaching uh, honors college colloquy classes right now. We did have a question in the chat. Love to address that. And so all of our honors college students start together in that cohort model. And so they live in Ingstrom together in the living learning community and um, launch off the whole year with the honors college orientation where you'll meet your first colloquy tutor there, that Socratic discussion class. And then you'll journey together in a cohort taking classes and get to know people across those different disciplines, but also across your overall class, which makes up for a very robust uh, classroom environment. Um, So just kind of answer that question a little bit. And so with that being said, all four of you have taught an honors college class before. What is your favorite topic that you've had the opportunity to cover in the honors college? Maybe describe a favorite memory in your colloquies or even relationships with your students. That's a really hard question, Curtis. To pick one topic. I'm currently teaching and uh, Dr. McCoy as well in nature, which is history of science, philosophy of science course. I would say just to blend in those two questions, just to be able to walk students through a few hundred years of history and to understand the limits of science and what science is and is not. Because currently there seems to be a lot of misperceptions and misunderstanding about what science is or can do. So helping students read original text and discuss these very um, difficult topics together has been very very, it's been very meaningful. And I think a favorite moment uh, would be when students connect the dots. So one colloquy, a student um, question about, we were reading Newton and how Newton in the middle of his supposedly calculus textbook would just have an adoration of God, which is unusual for textbook, let alone a math text, textbook. So we were just talking about how things can really, um, different things can, discipline can help us you know, point towards God to be in awe and wonder. And one student kind a question and challenge. Well, there are lots of injustice in the world. So I don't really see God the same way. And I didn't have to say anything. And that's probably my favorite colloquy because I can just sit back and watch um, all the students jump in and share about how they see the beauty of God and, and life through the different things, whether they are pleasant or unpleasant. So at the end of that colloquy, I just thought, wow, what a sacred moment that we have landed on. And I was just so privileged to be able to just help kind of guide and, and shepherd them through. And they were the active participants in that conversation. Well, the honors course that I teach most frequently is the fourth core course, which is basically from the late 1800s up through the late 1900s. And uh, that's a course students take in the fall of their junior year. And I'm remembering the final session of that course, the final colloquy from this past fall. Uh, I tend to like to meet outside uh, with my students, even pre-pandemic. And you know, we were outside in the amphitheater. And our topic for that week is faith and reason, the relationship between faith and reason. Uh, we're looking at Pope John Paul II's work on that subject and kind of bringing together a lot of the themes as we're wrapping up the core sequence in the Honors College. 
And a couple things uh, stand out. You know, there was one student uh, who had had you know, a particularly challenging semester of difficulties just in a in a job with some things going on with friends. And, you know, we've been hearing about these things because we pray for each other every week in colloquy. And just the way that I was so shocked to see that student grow in strength of ability to be able to discuss these texts with powerful insight week to week, culminating in that last session, despite all the obstacles she had encountered in that semester. I think that was just a testimony to what God was doing in her life. I like to charge my students in that last session with uh, a vision from uh, a great uh, Lebanese Christian statesman named Charles Malik, who was involved in creating the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And he he gave a speech once called The Two Tasks, about the tasks of the Christian university. And, and really, it's a, it's a great argument for why the Honors College exists, because he talks about the ways that Christians need to be working to understand the ways of the human spirit through the humanities and how they need to immerse themselves in Augustine's city of God and in Plato and Aristotle. So just being able to talk with the students about that vision and then hearing from the students in that session about why they appreciated so much being at APU because not all the students are Christians as opposed to some other schools that require you as a student to sign a statement of faith. These students felt that it actually aided their Christian journey to be around uh, more of a wide mix of students at different points on their spiritual journey. And just to hear how these students' faith had grown through interacting with the particular student mix we have here at APU, that was something that was really encouraging for me. Wow. Listening to both of you has made me think of too many different directions <laughs> where I'd like to take this question. I uh, teach Honors 280, which is the spring sophomore uh, core course, and then do some plenaries in, in other terms. And so right now I'm teaching in, in Honors 280. And I think, and this won't sound like it should be my happiest memory, but bear with me. There have been times in our class where, you know, we formed such a community in that colloquy room of, of trust and listening and freedom to speak that we've had students hit a point of um, just of tears or of kind of a point where the learning goes beyond I'm discussing a book and it it goes into each one of our real lives. So in, in reading the books that we read and in gathering together multiple times each week, we get to the point where we're helping each other formulate understanding and articulate perspectives. And by this point in the semester, we've become so strong and proficient at that, at that as a group that it it's amazing that students feel such a trust in the group that we have gotten into really what all of these texts that we're reading and where uh, the texts that we're reading end at about 1860-ish in this particular colloquy. So these are uh, what would now be considered older, although for some of us, that's not old at all. But still, for all of you, these are older texts. And uh, our discussion is, is so much on what these words mean to real life here and now today in students' lives. That that is, uh, that is what Dr. Wong was saying. Uh, there are some sacred moments in that. And uh, it's been really wonderful to watch students support one another in the ways even that they disagree with each other about how they would interpret the text or how they would apply the text. And so it's such a formative experience on so many levels. That has been a beautiful thing to watch. I would say personally, uh, what I really enjoy about the core courses for honors is the way that the courses bring books into conversation with one another and I'm talking about the books themselves that normally would not be taught 
together in one term. So I'm loving uh, watching my students discover new insights on Thomas Hobbes in the novel Jane Eyre. I'm I'm watching them and loving watching them make connections from Mary Wollstonecraft back to Milton's Paradise Lost or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to Descartes. And so it's the conversations you get to have in those colloquies with the books that are um, facing each other in the syllabus and the students facing each other around the table that are really, really uh, life changing and beautiful moments for, for them and not just for the students, but also, also for us many times. So I'll, I'll echo on that, that I like how the connections even continue past the course into the next course. My favorite paper that I got from a student last year was actually about Milton, but it was in the science class. <laughs> how does that happen? Uh, so I, I go home after colloquy every day and tell my wife about all of the crazy different directions of the conversation. I never really quite know where it's going to go. And I think that's great that everybody gets their chance to geek out on whatever gets them hyped and find connections to whatever the text is for that day. So my bit of geeking out, my favorite topic is from Einstein uh, when we're talking about special relativity. And and I like to to spin that to the nature of light because Einstein's findings do have some uh, ramifications that we don't have time to get into on what light means. And I'll take that to the metaphor of God is light. So what does that tell me about who God is? And just seeing that just explode students' minds and then they start writing down. <laughs> that, that's really fun. Fantastic. We'll love for our faculty members just to share just some closing remarks to future APU students, students who are in their overall college decision-making process. Do you have any closing remarks for our attendees and those who will be listening later? Well, since we're talking about honors college and this semester we are learning about science in in nature, uh, one thing we discussed is since Galileo, which is the beginning of our course, we looked at how Galileo faced challenges when he presented a paradigm shift or a scientific revolution, and he was not well received. So in our colloquy, we came up with our someone brought up the idea how those who are in power seem to be getting in the way when new information is being um, uh, announced or, or shared. So I think our challenge or invitation or encouragement to one another as a result of that was that well, hopefully when our students are in, in influential positions one day, in authority one day, they hopefully will not let arrogance or, or status get in the way. And my um, encouragement to you as incoming students is that I hope and pray you'll be lifelong learners, that you will continue to develop your critical thinking skills, regardless of where you are and how much money you make and, and your status. Because I think these upcoming four years will be so transformative. And I hope you will pick up have Habits, not just learning habits, but habits that will um, last for a whole lifetime. And as a result, you become whom God created you to be. As I was preparing for this panel, I pulled out this favorite article of mine uh, from a magazine in 1997 called Advice to Student Journalists. And uh, what was going on here was that my wife was applying for college, much like all of you are doing right now. And she had written in a letter to this magazine and said, what Christian college should I choose to pursue the study of journalism? And the magazine editor wrote back to her and said, uh, you'd be far better off over the long haul if you chose a major in history, literature, philosophy, biblical studies, or even one of the sciences. Make yourself as big a thinker and as big a person as you possibly can, I told her. That's the editor saying that. The technical skills will come. And uh, so... I think this exhortation, which, by the way, my wife followed to become an English major, as Dr. Petrie will be glad to know, you know, studying the most fundamental subjects like we do in the Honors College and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and really develop a depth in your thinking about the most fundamental aspects of God's creation that will allow you to gain uh, uh, entry into influential cultural conversations uh, later in your life, have the insight to bring to a number of different professional fields. So think about how to become a big thinker. And I really believe the APU Honors College can help you greatly in that quest. Yes. Oh, I have to just echo what both of you just said, that <laughs> those are all 
um, wonderful pieces of advice and really important pieces of advice that aren't heard often enough. To, to add to that is really just to echo what I think we have said overtly, but also has been a theme throughout on this panel. And that is that um, as a learner, you want to keep making connections between what you're learning, what you're reading, what you're writing, what you're being asked to do, who you're having conversations with. And so you want to make that intentionally. Um, learning is not, it never has been a checklist of things to get out of your way, requirements to take care of. It only becomes that if we let ourselves see it that way, or if we let someone else convince us that that's what it really is. So connect the dots um, from book to book, from class to class, layer uh, the knowledge that you're gaining um, with layers of context that you'll get from having professors uh, in one program from multiple disciplines. You can study through all of the lenses represented tonight and many others uh, in AP's Honors College, but also take the time to really customize your vision for how to apply what you're learning in your life now and in the life that you envision for your own future. You know, the newest research says that all of you are likely to change careers. Uh, at least, I think the newest research is at least five times. And I'm trying to be a little conservative because there might be new research that says more than that. And so to be a nimble thinker, someone who can creatively problem solve, someone who can transfer knowledge and skills in many contexts and for many applications, that's who you want to become no matter what you study or where you study it. My, my big advice would be uh, lot, lots of people these days think about college as a means to get the job that you want or the classes to be a means to get the skills that you need. I'd, I'd, I'd suggest that you shift your thinking from that, if that is your thinking, to who do you want to be? And then use all of your college time to help craft yourself into that person that you want to be.